<laughs> I, I do have one more question. Oh, okay. He's because yeah, we got to get um, him out of here. What would yeah. be your advice to any young filmmakers or comics who have to deal with the social media content cycle? Talk directly to homeless pimp. This so, is a question social from... media content cycle. Yeah, like you, you have to, you're forced to post to be relevant in the algorithm. That's not true. You don't think so? No. You think you, don't you have to? Right. Okay, just so you know up front, this video is going to be a little bit weird. I'm going to talk about Louis C.K.'s downfall from the top of the entertainment world to the backwaters of Hollywood's blacklist, and I'm also going to take you through several clips to try and answer the question, is Louis C.K. a legend or was he just a famous creep who got busted in the end? To really understand who he is though, I'm going to explain the link between Louis and Mr. Beast. That's right, you heard me correctly. Louis C.K. and Mr. Beast have something in common. Something big. And, well, I'll get to that in a moment. Let me start by giving you a quick background so we're all on the same page. In 2017, allegations against Louis were made by multiple women who accused him of inappropriate behaviour, including instances where he had celebrated Palm Sunday in front of them without their permission. The accusers included fellow female comedians, several of which he employed, and even though some of them had actually agreed to watch him visit the safety deposit box, the Me Too movement was so strong at the time thanks to Harvey Weinstein that the main concern wasn't what he actually did, but that those women who were involved felt compelled to agree to watch him cuff the carrot. I'll come back to these details towards the end because information subsequently came out that showed things weren't exactly as they seemed. <laughs> no kidding. Anyway, these instances of Louis finding Nemo reportedly took place over several years, some dating back to the early 2000s. But in November 2017, the New York Times published an article in which five women shared their experiences and accused Louis C.K. of cooking his cucumber in front of them. Following the publication of that article, Louis C.K. released a statement acknowledging that the allegations were true and he expressed remorse for his actions. He said, I want to address the stories told to the New York Times by five women named Abby, Rebecca, Dana and Julia who felt able to name themselves and one who did not. These stories are true. At the time, I said to myself that what I did was okay because I never showed a woman my Twinkie without asking first, which is also true, but what I learned later in life, too late, is that when you have power over another person, asking them to look at your salami isn't a real question. It's a predicament for them. So he went on to say as well, there is nothing about this that I forgive myself for and I have to reconcile it with who I am, which is nothing compared to the task I left them with. I wish I had reacted to their admiration of me by being a good example to them as a man and given them some guidance as a comedian, including because I admired their work. So then, in the wake of Louis' downstairs DJing scandal, he lost approximately $35 million in income. The release and distribution of his film I Love You Daddy was cancelled, FX and Netflix cut ties with him, HBO dropped his appearance on an upcoming Night of Too Many Stars television special, and they also removed his content from their on-demand services. His manager dropped him as a client and TBS scrapped its animated series The Cops, and his voice was either replaced or removed from projects such as The Secret Life of Pets 2 and Disney Channel's Gravity Falls. Woofed. $35 million. That's a lot of money, huh? Now we have to remember, Louis was never arrested or charged with a crime as a result of paddling his pink canoe. It was the classic trial by media followed by the commensurate virtue signaling cancellation that follows. So Louis took some time off in early 2018, but then he came back in August of 2018, around 10 months after he was cancelled, to do a set at the Comedy Cellar in New York. Recently, Joe, I gave Louis a shot at the club, you know, after his Yeah, I heard little, about that. And, you know, Louis called me up and said, hey, do you mind if I do a spot? And I thought about it. I said, yeah, sure, no problem. You know, I like Louis. He yeah. wasn't arrested or convicted of anything and yeah so i put him in he did fantastic he and calls me he said, what do you think i said yeah put and him on. after that evening the backlash was just unbelievable yeah you know just i go how long is enough what does this guy have to do to try to get his career back right but he, what is the backlash though because the backlash is not your your the actual customers right it, no not, it, 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 it was they grabbed some female comics a lot working that aren't mm -hmm. working for me and that's said that mike locked the doors and put a little predator on stage and you know mm. I, I was like 
<coughs> everyone there enjoyed Louis. And, you know, I'm just trying yeah. to help a friend get yeah. his life back. For those of you who aren't really familiar with Louis' style of comedy, he basically likes to go as deep into the darkness as he can with inappropriate, politically incorrect ideas and make you laugh at them with him. In a sense, he's kind of appealing to the voice inside of all of us and saying the quiet bit out loud. So when he came back that first night, he was trying bits about the trans community and a parkland survivor. Now, as you can imagine, because it was his first set in almost a year, especially after the whole scratching Yoda behind the ears controversy, it was going to attract a lot of attention. I got so angry when people were calling out your uh, that leak set yeah, yeah, when people was... are mad. Because to me, it was like, that's what he's always done. This is great stuff. Like, yeah. these are, But not only that, you hadn't done stand-up in 10 months. I'm like, this is the this is the seeds of a fantastic hour. Well, it was and you're a, only seeing, like, the, literally the first couple of right. times he's even said these things aloud in public. I just got so excited to be back on stage because I had yeah. taken a long time off and it was, and there was resistance coming back. But I was, it was, I was in a club with my crowd for the first time. And so I was... Uh, it was the only thing I regret is it was reckless because my life was very in, uh, precarious. Things were tough and things were tough for my kids. So that created a bigger, huge stink bomb than anything else that had even happened. The set did? Yeah, the set was really, really, really hard. So given how uh, things were, I probably could have made jokes about a couple other things. I don't believe ah. I did anything wrong. <laughs> you did what you always I done. do. I've always done this. The way it works is I say stuff that is the wrong thing to say. I hear the resistance to it, and then I and then Figure I work it with it and work with it. And it takes a few shows for it to be a safe bit to do. But there's a few audiences that that you know, and that audience actually didn't <laughs> didn't mind it. But it, it's not for regular. Consumption. It's like watching it's somebody ready. practice piano, yeah, and going like he sucks, or or it's not. It wasn't supposed to. The I think it's really bad that we don't have these barriers anymore. I absolutely agree. This was just a whole bunch of normies clutching at straws. If you heard the actual audio for yourself, the crowd absolutely loved it, and they were just happy to be there for such a seminal moment in Louis's comeback. Now, before I answer the question head on, is Louis a legend or is he a creep? There are a couple of things about him you need to know. We're going to dive into the mind of this guy now, and I'm going to show you how he does things differently. What you're going to see is a stark contrast between Louis and most of the other comedians I cover on this channel. Stick with me here because it's about to get really interesting. Something I've always, always wondered about you is you reach the mountaintop of, of the industry, right? Yeah. Like you're... You're going to be humble about this. I'm going to tell you what it felt like from the outside. Yeah, this okay. is outside looking in, right? Yeah. We're all looking at this guy who's <clears throat> we know is hilarious, and then all of a sudden the world finds out that he's hilarious, and he's doing whatever he wants to do. You do a show, it's critically acclaimed. You have this weird thing where you're like beloved by like working class mainstream people and Hollywood. Mm. Even your face is uncomfortable because I'm complimenting you. This is like a comic thing I've realized. It's hard. Yeah. To, it's okay. And then you go independent. I yeah. think a lot of us went independent because we didn't have the opportunity yeah. to do these things, right? <clears throat> you chose yeah. to go independent. Why? I I never understood it. I imagine everybody's like begging you to produce shows. They're going, please, can you write a show, Louis? Oh my God, can you make this movie? Can you do whatever you want? Well, it always seemed like the smart thing to do to me because and the it felt good. I liked the way it felt more than anything else. Because you see so much waste in the way things are done yeah, yeah, yeah. and so much stuff that's about, why are we doing this? Yeah. Oh, God, I wish we didn't have to do that. So I didn't do that ground up like these guys did. I came up through the industry, a comedy club, hammering at comedy clubs. Then I went to television, learned television, learned how to write TV and tried having my own show in different places and stuff. But when I got... All of that upstream battle is not much you can do except keep trying and try. You don't have any control over how you do it. Mm. <clears throat> but when I got to be big, when I got to the place where I'm like, um, if I put something on sale, it sells out. It's guaranteed, right? When you get to that place, yeah, yeah. that when your show is announced in any, and where I was at a point where it's like any building on earth yeah, 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 yeah. will take my my uh, um, engagement, I can book it. Yeah. And if I announce it, it will sell out. It got yeah. to that crime. Yeah. Not like giant stadium. There's I'm not Kevin that... Hart. What do you do with that power? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you do with that? So you can go to the big companies and say, write me a huge check 
because of the power that I have. But uh, to me, it was far more interesting to figure out <clears throat> who are these guys? How did this, who books this place? How does this happen? And wonder if I can do some version of it myself. And also when you sell your own tickets, when you go directly to fans, you get the Glenn Gary leads. You get their, if Ticketmaster and Live Nation sell your tickets for you, yep. they get those emails, they, they get yeah, those contacts, everything. they have control over your audience. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if they have come, I have an email list that's yeah. people that have been coming to my live shows yeah. and buying my specials since way back. So the way this all works is Louis is able to reduce the price of his tickets and his exclusive content because he hosts it all through his own website. Earlier this year, he did MSG and live streamed it on his website for around 20 bucks, and he left it up for a week or two afterward as well. And he's even bypassed Ticketek to avoid their massive markups, as well as to retain all his fans' data himself, like he just outlined in that clip. He bought the rights to his TV show, Louis Off FX, and he put it on his website as well. Guys like Andrew Schultz pretend that they're independent, but they still rely on YouTube and Netflix to find their audience for them. And this is where Louis broke the algorithm. I'll explain the link with Mr. Beast in just a moment. You know, you understand what you're doing with this algorithm is you're trying to get the attention of an artificial brain. It's a really weird endeavor is to obsess about what will this... An algorithm is a, if I understand correctly, it's an equation. So you're trying to make that equation pick you up. Like it used to be that you either get obsessed with your own work, like you're just obsessed with your work. You love your jokes or right. you have a voice you need to get out. Uh, but then the other side of the spectrum was uh, wanting to be famous. I want right. attention. But that used to make people think about what do people like? What do people laugh at? What's, right. what's appealing? Right. And looking at humans and looking at audiences and going, how can I make them get me? Or things like, how can I get uh, the, the, the gatekeepers to give me a shot? These were obsessions. Mm -hmm. But now this abstract thing of like, how do I fit? How do I get this artificial brain to spread me to people that don't give a shit? If I, you know, the way it used to work is if you, if you do something worthwhile, somebody might see it and share it with a friend. Yeah, it's true. It's the worst thing you could be doing right now is trying to follow the algorithm, trying to be as much like other people in the algorithm as you can be and trying to shave away any part of you that might not fit in the keyhole. That's a sick f***ed up thing to do because the target isn't even a human being. It's, right. not, even, it's not even audiences. It's just a, it's a computer. It's, yeah. taking, it's, it's taking part in something that's really sick. If you go against it and you just don't give a sh and you just keep doing your thing, you live or die by it. Yeah. You spend your whole life trying to get post. You're for, listen to what you're saying, forced to post. That's a crazy thing. Yeah. And the amount of money that's being made by those companies because you just believe that you are a slave to that. There's no other way. So think about guys like Schultz, Tom, Burt, and Matt Reif as well. The list goes on and on. But these guys create content right here on YouTube and all over social media specifically to go viral and send traffic into their ecosystem so they can use the algorithm to find new fans and monetize them at every step of the way. And as a result, Louis thinks that this is killing comedy, and I couldn't agree with him more. You don't think it'll impact comedy overall if everyone s subscribes to these new rules? To what new rules? Being forced to post and say. Yeah, I think it hurts comedy. I know it does. Young comics are, I mean, there's a stagnation in comedy. It hasn't I, You always see new guys come up and you see people getting better. I see it. That there are a lot, of, it's grinding to a slow crawl now. Folks aren't getting, I've seen people that I saw getting funnier stop getting funnier. Interesting. And I've seen some of the newer comedians, they, they just become more interested in this mm -hmm. and keeping this going because they get big enough that this gets huge. And then they get, yeah. the Lord, there's comedians that, are, that got big and I'm like, I, get, I love comedy. So I get excited. We just quietly watch them and go, yeah. that's a new voice. But then they get so big that this blows up and then they go like this and they're not doing the jokes aren't, they're not getting better anymore. They're not obsessed with the jokes anymore. They're just getting bathed in the sunshine of this thing now. It's like the other side of it from young comics who just can't quite get there. When this blows up. Yeah. How do we stop that though? What's, what's going to happen? Well, you got to stay. You got to. I just think that this is not. 
it's not good for co- comics well, should want should be starved for attention and should just yeah. be feeling alone. And also, if you all you should be thinking about is your work. All you should be thinking about is what you say to the audience, no matter how many. If it's twenty at an open mic or a hundred at a, at the cellar or wherever you are. Because that's the only thing that's going to make you look back at your life and be happy with it. You're not going to be happy. That's not, what are you, what are you? Yeah. And uh, the king of the algorithm? Mm-hmm. The f- kind of life is that? Yeah, yeah, it, it's true. It's easy for me to say because I've been through it all. But I went through my own version of it. I've been doing this for 38 years. And I didn't get, I didn't get big until I'd been doing it for like 25 well, so I'm, that's how long it took so, me. So, so I'm not talking from, I'm not like a guy who exploded after five years and then I'm like, yeah, hey, you guys don't need this stuff. <laughs> I mean, I did it the hard way. Right. And that road, that 25 year road was to me, it's the only road to really being a great comic. It's also the same road to shit, to nothing. <laughs> right. Because yeah. it takes 25 years to find out right. that you never should have started. <laughs> it's the same road. It's a rough in life. It's amazing, man. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's actually great advice that you almost never hear. Now, don't be mistaken. Louis was just talking about the guys that I cover on this channel. 100%. He described them to a T. Their eyes are glued to their phones and social media accounts, so their comedy is suffering as a result. You can't serve two masters. But I think we're at a point now where I can start to put all the pieces of this puzzle together for you. And I'm not going to lie, I'm kind of excited to share all this stuff with you guys and nerd out for a little bit. Don't worry though, I'm definitely going to bring it all back together and tie it all up in a little bow. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to give you a little insider secret that most YouTubers don't even know about. And just so you know I'm not screwing around, I'll use Mr. Beast as an example because he figured this out a long time ago. Have you ever noticed that when he posts a new video on YouTube, and then he goes onto Twitter or Instagram, he never actually provides a link to the video. He'll just post a screenshot or a photo and say something like, go watch the video or just go watch. Now he's got tens of millions of followers across his social media accounts. Why wouldn't he just post a link? And have you guys noticed that I don't have social media at all? I'll let you guys in on a little secret. What Louis C.K. was talking about was absolutely 100% correct. In fact, I don't even think Louis realizes how right he is just in a slightly different context, but it's all based on the same principle. YouTube's algorithm punishes channels that get most of their views from external links. What the algorithm does instead is it promotes content that gets good traffic organically through YouTube. So when Mr. Beast posts on Twitter saying, hey, I just dropped a new video, go watch, What he wants you to do is open YouTube, type in Mr. Beast, and click on his thumbnails on YouTube, not from an external link. Or even better, he wants you to open the app and see his thumbnail in your feed and click on the video. Now, what that does is it teaches YouTube's algorithm that everyone who watches Mr. Beast videos watches them by clicking on his videos in YouTube. So the algorithm realizes that his videos are in high demand organically through their own ecosystem rather than externally from links. Okay, so what does this have to do with anything? What Louis was just saying was that he got big by word of mouth and people sharing his content, which is the complete opposite of how the Brogan comedy brats gained traction in the last few years. They used their big social media followings that they got from going on Joe Rogan and used those accounts to drive traffic to YouTube, onto their channels, onto their podcasts, and they get stuck in this endless cycle of promoting themselves instead of focusing on their comedy like Louis does. And the worst part is they're actually hurting their exposure by doing it because now YouTube is punishing channels that rely on external links so that YouTube can compete with other social media sites. You see, YouTube just wants you to go on their app and stay there. That's why I don't make shorts. I don't do clips. I don't post on Twitter. I don't post on Instagram. I just make videos and upload them. I get emails almost every day from social media gurus offering to edit shorts and clips from my videos and post them on socials for me and manage it all for a low price. These so-called experts have no idea how the algorithm actually works. 
And that's why Louis C.K. is a low-key genius. The guy gets it. He understands that you can't rely on an extended ecosystem to get that traction. What you need to do is create good content that your fans love and just focus on that, like Mr. Beast does. So now that you have that bit of information in your back pocket, let's move into the final phase of this video and put the pieces of the puzzle together and tie this all up. When you were like on your mountaintop, mm. the industry you, especially because you worked your way up through the industry and that's the only way to get in, in the industry you were the darling. Mm. Everything this guy does is amazing, groundbreaking, etc. Is that addictive? Because after 2017, it's not there anymore, but you're still putting out the same product. The fans still like it the same. So is that something that you feel like, man, f I miss that? Or is it like, no, nah, I'm still putting out the same product. Good the fans question. Are and I, I was in very, Two good one of the better... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Fire, never him. Get Fire him. Fire him. Never get his approval. What if you switch seats? Yeah. That might be better. <laughs> Please try. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah that Jesus. way you could kind of. Yeah, I'm going to no, be over I like here. the question from over there better, though. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. oh, it's the chair. Well, it's too late oh, now. It God. might be the chair. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, your question was oh, yeah. So I, it was actually a great discovery for me because I didn't know what it would be like. Because mm -hmm. when you're there and we're taking private jets to do stadiums, which is kind of a grind, it's not. It's not really what got me into comedy was yeah. the big stuff. And I'm also never been comfortable with uh, fa big fame. The big like, oh, my God, fame is just it doesn't make me feel like a per I like feeling like a person. Yeah. So when somebody treat, treats you bigger than that or yeah. less than that, both stink to me. Yeah. It just makes me uncomfortable. I don't I can't I don't identify with mm -hmm. that. And the industry, I knew it from I mean, it's, I've been doing this for 37 years. So that I was in it long enough to know that when I was getting a lot of acceptance from there, I was like, yeah, right. Like, I know this is short lived. I know this is conditional. Yeah. And I know a lot of it is just wind. I think people are quick to forget just how big Louis got at his peak in 2017. He lost $35 million in immediate income in that year. That is an insane amount of money. The guy was super famous. And judging of what he just said on Flagrant, he didn't like it. It wasn't for him. Guys like Schultz, Tom, and Bert, they thrive off it. They live for it. But for Louis, it seemed like it all got a bit too much for him. Now, what Louis did was creepy. I mean, it's not a normal thing to randomly start burping the worm in front of other people. But having said that, I don't actually think Louis is a creep. And the reason why is that he's almost completely harmless. There's a difference between doing something creepy and being a full-blown creep. Let me put it to you another way, and I'm going to go kind of deep here, so bear with me. I've obviously thought about this a little too much. Don't worry, I'm aware. Louis got to a point where he was so famous, he could do whatever he wanted. He could sell out any venue. He could make TV shows, movies. He could get booked for any talk show, any podcast, anything. He could do anything, and I don't think he liked that. I think Louis acted out and did those creepy things as a cry out for help. I know that sounds weird and cliche, but he clearly wasn't enjoying that sort of sycophantic celebrity status that he unwillingly cultivated. Perhaps he stripped down and flopped it out to play five on one because he was trying to prove a point to himself and everyone around him that he doesn't deserve all the attention and praise. It's kind of like, look how fat and ugly I am, but you'd still sit here and watch me making waffles because I'm super famous. So in a sense, it's almost like a form of self-deprecating humor, where he's making himself the joke instead of being the joke teller. I think he felt stupid. I really do. He would have been living a life that felt like a complete lie to him, and he just went kind of nuts. Now look, I, I know that sounds kind of weird, right? And I fully appreciate if you think that I'm crazy. I probably am, okay? But Louis seems like too deep of a person to do something that weird and not have some underlying psychological issue underpinning all of it. I seriously think the guy's a genius. I'm also not trying to justify what he did because I do think it's inappropriate and corny, even if he did supposedly ask permission or whatever before he took a self-guided tour. But like Joe Rogan recognized, there clearly was a lot of social grandstanding going on and opportunism within that so-called Me Too movement. It's not as simple as the mainstream media would have you believe, believe it or not. There's a lot to that story that would make him look very different in a lot of these people that are accusing him. And one day I think he's going to tell us. So he, I had a conversation with him about it. It's, it's not as cut and dry as everybody thinks. Right. Everybody thinks he had power over these women and he pulled his dick out and started. No, there was a lot of... There was a lot of 
talk. Mm-hmm. There was a lot of flirting. There was a lot going on. It wasn't that simple. And he's very, Con- ve- he's very contrite about it. Yes, yeah. very, very. And he knows he fucked up. And by the way, he hadn't done anything like that in more than a decade. Right. It was a long time. <laughs> he just, he just, he's got a kinky thing. He looks just, off in front of people. Said- yeah, look, I think Joe is mostly right there, but the way he just dismisses it all as a kinky thing is kind of stupid. I mean, to randomly start boxing the one-eyed champ in front of people is not normal behavior, but it definitely was a case of being at the wrong place, doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. He caught the worst part of the wave. Oh, yeah. You know, like if you're in the ocean and you could be in the ocean on a, on a fucking surfboard and you just catch this little tiny wave and everything's fine, or you could f- up and be in the right spot when that giant wave comes and slams you in the head and you have the same intention in the same person and other in other times in history he would have been fine he he would probably be fine today because everything is kind of there's enough of the females that have come out that have been full of like Asia Argento and the girl who accused Chris Hardwick and then Chris Hardwick released all these text messages that show that she actually cheated on him and she wanted right. him back and she's just trying to punish him for all this. But these, there's a, a few of those situations now where people realize, well, well there's, there's definitely predators and there's definitely bad men, and but there's also women who are taking advantage of this movement. Right. And I think the, the world is sort of like calmed down a little. Like the Asia Argento th- one was a big one. Mm. You know, when she, it turned out that she was calling Harvey Weinstein a while she was f***ing a 17-year-old. Right. That right, she right, was, right. she played his mom in a movie 10 mm. years ago when mm. he was seven. I'm so glad Joe publicized all those things in his podcast because they're so important to understand in the context of what happened. It's exactly like he said. A lot of the people who got involved with these sorts of controversies and made accusations and claims about certain things either had bombing careers or they were just full-blown hypocrites. For Hollywood to act like they were all shocked by all of those revelations that came out of the Me Too movement as if they've been living in a Disney movie for a hundred years, I mean, that's completely ridiculous. There are so many secrets that are yet to come out, and I'll put my own money on the biggest culprits being the loudest voices when it comes to virtue signaling and demanding social justice. Anyway, to cap things off, I think it's obvious that Louis was a victim of his own success, and perhaps he even self-sabotaged himself and brought on his own downfall. But it's undeniable that he is an absolute legend, even though he did a few creepy things over the years. Both of those things can be true at the same time. Louis C.K. is well and truly the Mr. Beast of the comedy world, even if he loved to polish the banister in front of an audience. Anyway, that's it from me, folks. I hope you enjoyed this breakdown of the rise, fall, and rise of Louis C.K. Drop a comment below and let me know what you think about all of this. And if you haven't subscribed, consider jumping on board so you get all my uploads right there in your feed. Thanks for joining me. I'll catch you in the next one. I'm not a gardener, but there is a garden in this house I have out in Shelter Island. Mm -hmm. And I don't garden. I don't plant anything. But I, it's kind of crazy. I go in there and I just dig. I just get my hands in the dirt. I just touch the soil.